Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. And as always, uh, let's bring you the latest headlines from around the world. China to invest $20 billion in India as part of a five-year trade and economic development plan. Prime Minister Modi and President Xi agree to widen strategic partnership. Glasgow says yes, but the no's win the historic Scott referendum. Scotland to remain a part of the United Kingdom, at least for now. France joins airstrikes against Islamic State. French jets strike a building in northern Iraq. Airstrikes come days after Hollande hosted a meeting of international leaders on the militant crisis. And 17th Asian Games kick off in Incheon, South Korea. High hopes from the Indian athletes despite a tough draw in most events. Our top focus on the show this week, Chinese President Xi Jinping wrapped up his three-day visit to India on Friday. Before leaving, Xi praised India's rapid economic development and sought cooperation between the two nations in this endeavor. Meanwhile, Chinese troops backed down after Modi raised the Chinese incursion issue with Xi on Thursday. Here's more. A day after signing a five-year trade and economic development plan with India, Chinese President Xi Jinping praised the neighbor's rapid development. He said that he wishes to strengthen the bilateral ties further for the benefit of the region. President Xi also gave an assurance that a stronger China is no more a threat to anyone. Meanwhile, Chinese troops have backed down in Ladakh a day after Modi raised concerns over incursions at the border. Reports of incursions by PLA troops in Chumur days ahead of Xi Jinping's visit had overshadowed talks between the two leaders. We were keen to raise some of the tricky issues, the border issues, as well as the Chinese policy on the staple visa issue, for instance, for the Jammu and Kashmir people from Arunachal Pradesh, and also the Pakistan nuclear cooperation that goes on uh, uninterruptedly, in a sense. So these are some of the political issues that we were planning to take up, and I think that has rightly so come up uh, during the uh, talks between the two leaders. I welcome this. Uh, both countries will have to work together in good earnest to sort out the border uh, disputes and uh, both countries should uh, respect the line of actual control. On the last day of his visit, the Chinese president met former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, Lok Sabha Speaker Sumitra Mahajan, Congress President Sonia Gandhi and the party's Vice President Rahul Gandhi. He also met the family of Dr. Dwarkanath Kotnis, who is revered in China for his sacrifice during the China-Japan War in 1942. With inputs from Akhilesh Suman for Rajya Sabha TV. Joining me on the show this week is Mr. Srikant Kondapalli, Professor in Chinese Studies Center for East Asian Studies, uh, JNU. Professor, welcome to the show. Uh, I'd like to know from you, of course, because you follow everything so closely as far as China is concerned. Uh, what are the main takeaways from President Xi's visit to India? Uh, I think about uh, uh, five of these, I, I assume, uh, could be highlighted. Mm. Uh, one is in terms of the $20 billion that you refer to. Mm. Uh, uh, which is uh, for the next five years' time uh, mm. involving in the infrastructure projects and uh, 
uh, industrial parks as well as manufacturing hubs uh, and the railway projects, uh, mm. high-speed mm. railway projects, number one. Number two, in terms of the, uh, the overall uh, territorial dispute, there has been uh, some assurances and uh, some backing off uh, in terms of the uh, mobilization on the border areas. Uh, so uh, with the uh, Prime Minister raising uh, several concerns on this mm. issue, uh, the stability-related aspects are coming up uh, more prominently. Uh, I would uh, suggest that the meeting between uh, President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Modi mm. uh, and their outing in Ahmedabad mm. Um, mm. in Sabarmati Ashram mm. and the Sabarmati Riverfront uh, the the kind of uh, discussion that went uh, between them, I think this is the most uh, uh, intangible uh, outcome of the visit, uh, in the sense that uh, as two nuclear states, uh, mm. this is very important that each understand the other's intentions mm. uh, and the leadership qualities. Uh, this is very essential. Uh, most commentators ignore uh, the kind of personal rapport that and the personal chemistry that uh, emerged between Modi and Xi uh, yes. in the uh, day before yesterday. Uh, I, I think this is the most crucial um, aspect uh, of the, and, and successful aspect of the whole visit. Mm. The rest of them, uh, the Chinese will invest if Indian economic growth rates are good. Mm. Uh, Chinese will invest if they make profits in the Indian market. Mm. So it's a purely business kind of uh, investment. I it don't is, think is, we need to. I mean, I mean, that's how the Chinese invest, isn't it? It's all about business for them. It's all about what the Chinese economy gets first, and only then they'll see to it what the other person takes away. Indeed. Uh, but the Chinese investments also have a certain political element. Mm. Uh, they try to invest in places where, uh, in addition to profits, they also get some political mileage. Mm. Uh, in Africa, in Asia and South America, they have invested... And most of these are not very transparent deals mm, uh, mm. in these countries. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Uh, and uh, the long-term resource exploitation in these countries is quite rampant with the Chinese mm. investments. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I think there is also a touch uh, of political element in the Chinese investments. Talking about investments, of course, uh, the Consul General uh, of China, uh, uh, you know, a few, uh, a few days before she, President Xi visited India, said that investments would be to the tune of $100 billion dollars. But then, at the end of the day, when uh, President Xi went back, it was just $20, million, $20 billion, I beg your pardon. So, I mean, wh why the discrepancy? Uh, a few months ago, they have also floated the figure of $300 billion. Mm. Uh, so, from 300 to $100 billion to uh, finally $20 billion. Mm. Uh, a huge uh, uh, expectations raised because of these uh, suggestions. Uh, possibly the uh, Chinese were backing off because they were not getting the, uh, the positive vibes from mm. the Indian side. This could be one reason. Secondly, they were trying to showcase initially after uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit to Japan uh, and the $35 billion in the next five years, they probably, there is a competitive element into this whole process between Japan and China. Mm. Uh, this could be another reason uh, for the... Uh, the coming down from the 100 billion to about 20 billion mm. dollars. Uh, uh, most important, I think they are, they are watching uh, how the Indian economy could pros possibly perform this year mm. and mm. the next mm. year. Mm. Uh, my reading is that the Chinese are actually going to lose in the Indian market okay. uh, because the Japanese made uh, uh, various signals mm. of investment in the Delhi-Mumbai industrial corridor, the Bangalore to China high-speed railway, uh, and a host of other projects, freight corridors and industrial corridors. Uh, the Japanese investment is pretty heavy, and that's the reason why Prime Minister Modi uh, ch had chosen Tokyo as his first visit. Yes. In the case of uh, United States, uh, some in the Obama administration have suggested that they want to see India at a $10 trillion economy, which mm -hmm. is roughly what the Chinese GDP is now. Mm -hmm. uh, if these signals... Uh, uh, do provide for any investment flows in, into India, uh, I think the Chinese actually are going to lose in the Indian market okay. in the long term. Okay, that, that's of course uh, the way you look at it, of course, and it remains to be seen what happens on that front. But, uh, you know, another crucial thing happened this week, uh, uh, Professor Kondopalli. What happened was, you know, India signed some crucial deals with Vietnam a day before President Xi was to visit India. Could that have had any kind of bearing on what happened here in India? 
Well, with Vietnam, uh, regardless of the China factor, uh, Indian foreign policy always emphasized on good relations with Vietnam. Um, remember in the 1979 when, when Mr. Vajpayee was the foreign minister, uh, he cancelled the visit to uh, he uh, uh, cancelled the visit to China midway uh, after China started military action on Vietnam in yes. 1979. Um, uh, Vietnam is very crucial for India, uh, part, partly because of the traditional friendship that we have had. Uh, secondly, the Vietnamese have given uh, the ONGC Videsh Limited uh, several blocks in the South China Sea for extracting oil and gas. Uh, and it is estimated that South China Sea has 190 trillion cubic feet of uh, gas, uh, which would be for the next 100 years or so if uh, India gets these uh, resources. For 100 years or so, Indian energy requirements could be met with those, mm. uh, with, the, with that kind of findings in South China Sea. So energy is a very crucial aspect for India. and. Uh, secondly, 55% of Indian trade is passing through the South China Sea. Yes. So in other words, this is a very, very crucial area. Uh, and I think India is investing uh, for its own national interests mm -hmm. uh, in this mm -hmm. region, regardless of the China factor. So mm -hmm. I do not think that uh, it had cast uh, any shadow on the... Uh, in any case, the Chinese have had good relations with Pakistan, including in terms of the nuclear and ballistic missile uh, mm -hmm. transfers. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at also the um, uh, President Xi Jinping's deals in Maldives, the GMR company, which was not, which was asked to leave in 2012, mm. now the uh, uh, the Malay airport construction is given to a Chinese company. Yes, yes. In other words, uh, President Xi also started this balance of power. Uh, kind of uh, situation, mm. both in Maldives as well as in Sri Lanka. Although these have uh, commercial, uh, mainly commercial, but there is an element of balance of power. So I think, I think uh, the uh, the Chinese leaders have mm. had the balance of power approach, uh, and there is there is nothing wrong in China in India also approaching Vietnam. Uh, Japan, United States, and other countries. Indeed, indeed, there is nothing wrong in that. Of course, another uh, important and tricky issue is the you know issue of the line of actual control and the border incursions. Now, uh, China has assured India that it won't happen anymore. But can it be taken at face value, or should India still be cautious? I think India should be very cautious and should be prepared for any contingency in this area. Mm. Uh, the, uh, some of the officials um, uh, have indicated that uh, the People's Liberation Army had uh, mobilized nearly a thousand troops. If this figure is true, this is quite unprecedented. Mm. Because in 1967, when the Jalapla-Natula incident took place, yes. there were only a few troops involved in that incident. In Samdurangchu in 1987, over 250 Chinese troops were present in that, mm. uh, in that uh, event. Uh, and last year, during April um, um, 15th to May 6th mm. incident in Depsang Plains, over 200 Chinese patrols were positioned. So these figures indicate that the 1,000 troops, if the PLA had, uh, then it is a major incident. Uh, and I think we should take a very cautious, and also we, sh we need to prepare very well militarily on the line of actual control. All right, uh, Professor Kondopalli, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining us on the program this week and sharing your valuable inputs on uh, President Xi's visit to India. On that note, of course, it's time for a very short break, but on the other side, we'll tell you which way the Scots have voted in their referendum. All that and much more, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, Scotland will stay with the United Kingdom. By an overwhelming 55%, a majority of voters rejected the possibility of Scotland breaking away and becoming an independent nation. British Prime Minister David Cameron welcomed the decision and pledged to fulfil his commitments on giving additional powers to the Scottish Parliament. Smiles, cheers, claps and tears of joy. The No Campaign headquarters in Glasgow saw scenes of celebrations for the rejection of independence for Scotland. The naysayers won by 2 million votes to favour retaining the 307-year-old union with England and Wales. The final margin of 55.25% percent 
to 44.65% showed a much wider gap than opinion polls suggested. And like millions of other people, I am delighted. As I said during the campaign, it would have broken my heart to see our United Kingdom come to an end. So now it is time for our United Kingdom to come together and to move forward. A vital part of that will be a balanced set settlement, fair to people in Scotland and importantly to everyone in England, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. And Scotland has, by majority, decided not at this stage to become an independent country. I, I accept that verdict of the people and I call on all of Scotland to follow suit in accepting the democratic verdict of the people of Scotland. Most leaders said the rejection of independence heralded the start of a campaign for greater devolution of powers throughout the United Kingdom. Was a vote for change. Change doesn't end today, change begins today. Because we know our country needs to change. We know our country needs to change in the way it is governed, and we know our country needs to change in who it is governed for. The markets witnessed relief. The pound sterling jumped, reaching a new two-year high against the euro in Asian trading hours. The most important thing is removal of uncertainty. You're not going to have 18 months of negotiations over the pound, over the currency, over the debt sharing, all the other issues uh, that go with it. And so that's why you're seeing um, sterling rising against the dollar and against the euro this morning. And a bit of relief rally in Scottish companies like RBS, which is up over 4% this morning. It was a historic vote. The news of the referendum reverberated across Europe. There were congratulatory messages from European countries. Que ayer han decidido de manera clara e inequívoca seguir formando parte del Reino Unido y por extensión de la Unión Europea. En Schottland Ratschläge gegeben, das ist in der internationalen Politik immer ratsam und deshalb sage ich jetzt auch nur, ich respektiere es und sage das mit einem Lächeln. Queen Elizabeth II, who monitored the referendum with interest, was due to make a written statement. It was understood that her remarks will focus on reconciliation. Cameron wants to move fast to show that the three main UK party leaders will live up to their commitments made during the referendum campaign to devolve more powers to the Scottish Parliament. France joined the airstrikes against Islamic State militants. French planes carried out airstrikes on IS targets in Iraq. The French airstrike on the militants comes days after Hollande hosted a meeting of international leaders on the crisis. Less than 24 hours after President François Hollande announced he had approved a request from the government in Baghdad for air support, at least two French Rafale planes attacked the insurgents' positions. Ce matin, à 9h40, conformément aux ordres que j'avais donnés, des avions Rafale ont euh, pilonné un objectif et l'ont entièrement détruit. Cet objectif se situait au nord-est de l'Irak and était essentiellement a depot logistic that served to mount these operations. Other actions will take place in the coming days. France's Defence Ministry said the destroyed building containing vehicles, weapons and fuel had been hit four times. The Defence Ministry statement read, We were able to do this thanks to the reconnaissance missions we have been carrying out since Monday. The mission was carried out in direct coordination with the Iraqi authorities and our allies in the region. Unquote. The US is marshalling a coalition of almost 30 countries, Western allies, as well as countries in the Middle East, to confront the militant group. Obama's strategy was backed by the Senate. The Senate's 78 to 22 vote, a day after the House passed the measure, masked serious doubts that some senators had. Meanwhile, hundreds of Syrian Kurds gathered on the border, seeking to cross into Turkey after Islamic State fighters seized 21 villages and besieged a Kurdish city in northern Syria. Turkish security forces stood guard as crowds waited at border fences. Close to a thousand Syrian Kurds continued to gather on the border, seeking to cross into Turkey on Friday. Their plight remains uncertain. Well, much else has been unfolding around the world. Here's a quick wrap of the other international news of the week. The 
UN Security Council has declared Ebola in West Africa a threat to international peace and security. The council unanimously adopted a resolution calling on states to provide more resources to combat the outbreak. In Guinea, eight bodies of health workers and journalists have been found days after they were attacked, distributing information about Ebola in a Guinean village. Ready. At least five UN peacekeepers have been killed and three wounded by a roadside bomb in Mali. The attack happened in north of the country in the Kidal region. The deaths of the soldiers brings the number of UN peacekeepers in Mali killed to 10 this month alone. Mali descended into chaos after a coup in 2012 and is facing an insurgency led by Islamist militants. At least 23 people were killed and 56 injured in three suicide car bomb blasts in the Shiite-dominated neighborhood of Kadimia in Baghdad on Thursday. The blasts were followed by 12 mortar rounds fired in from outside the district. Reports say the attackers were likely targeting the Kadimia prison in a possible prison breakout attempt. A murder case has been registered against Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif over the alleged killing of two protesters during last month's protest in Islamabad. A case has also been registered against his brother and Punjab Chief Minister Shahbaz Sharif, three other ministers and top police officials. The case was registered under Anti-Terrorism Act and Pakistan Penal Code sections that deal with murder, attempt to murder, attack and abetment of attack. Time to bring you up to speed with all the sports news that you might have missed this week. Here's all the sports action. India's wait for a return to the world group continued as the hosts lost 3-2 to Serbia in the Davis Cup. After trailing 2-0 on the first day, India put up a spirited comeback to level the tie at 2-2. Leander Pays and Yuki Bambri played one of the best doubles matches to give India the first win before Somdev produced a brilliant five-set win to level the matter. Yuki, however, lost the final reverse singles match to hand Serbia the win. Floyd Mayweather remains the WBA and WBC welterweight boxing champion after a unanimous points victory over Marcos Maidana in Las Vegas. It extends five-weight world champion Mayweather's unbeaten run to 47 fights. The pro Maidana crowd filled with Argentines cheered his every move, but it was Mayweather who continually touched him with jabs and counter-right hands. In just the second rematch of his 18-year career, the 37-year-old American emerged as a comfortable winner on all the three judges' scorecards. Bayern Munich's Jerome Boateng scored a last-minute winner to deny Manchester City a point in their opening Champions League group game. Former City defender Boateng's fierce shot took a slight deflection of Mario Gotze as it flew across Joe Hart after City failed to clear a corner. Italian great Valentino Rossi led a Yamaha 1-2 to claim his maiden win of the season at the San Marino Motor Grand Prix and launched his bid for a 10th world title. Rossi, a nine-time world champion in all categories, finished the 28-lap race ahead of Spanish teammate Jorge Lorenzo with Danny Pedrosa on a Honda in third. Championship leader Marquez finished 16th after crashing his Honda on the early laps and trailing at the back of the field for most of the contest. Here's a look now at what's creating uh, news across the entertainment world. Here's our entertainment wrap. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has appointed Leonardo DiCaprio as a UN Messenger of Peace to promote global action on climate change. I'm delighted to announce that the new boys will be joining our climate advocacy efforts. Leonardo DiCaprio. The actor is invited to address the heads of state and government in attendance, including Barack Obama and David Cameron. DiCaprio joins 11 other prominent world figures who advocate on behalf of the UN as messengers of peace, including fellow actors Michael Douglas and George Clooney. They disliked me, then they liked me. They hated me, and now they love me. This line comes shortly before the final act of Gone Girl, the much-anticipated film adaptation of the best-selling book by Gillian Flynn, directed by David Fincher. The film is set for an October 3rd release. Ben Affleck stars as Nick Dunn in the film. He plays a fallen golden boy with a questionable moral compass and gets raked over by the tabloids and pilloried by the public, which suspect him of murdering his wife Amy, played by Rosamund Pike.
Barbara Streisand may collect her 10th number one album on the Billboard 200 chart next week with the arrival of a new all-star duet album, Partners. Partners features Streisand duetting with all-male hit parade of singers including Stevie Wonder, Michael Bublé, Blake Shelton, Billy Joel and Lionel Richie. If Partners hits number one, it will make Streisand the first artist with number ones in each of the past six decades and it would extend her lead as the female artist with the most number one albums. Pop star Taylor Swift was named People Magazine's Best Dressed Celebrity of the Year. Swift led the annual unranked list of the top 10 best dressed celebrity style icons that also included Oscar winner Lupita Yongo, singers Jennifer Lopez and Rihanna and actresses Emma Stone and Emma Watson. Well, Incheon witnessed a colourful opening ceremony on the 17th Asian Games on Friday. Around 13,000 competitors from 45 countries will compete for 439 gold medals in the next two weeks. The Indian contingent would be looking to better the medal tally of 65 claimed at China four years ago. I'm going to leave you with some of the colourful moments from the ceremony. Enjoy and I'll see you again same time next week. Korean President Park Geun hye officially declared open the 17th edition of the Asian Games in Incheon on Friday. 17th Asia begin. Park Geun hye opens the 17th Asian Games. Incheon 2014 is officially begun. The world's second biggest multi-sports spectacle after the Olympic Games will see around 13,000 athletes from 45 countries competing over the next 15 days. Pop sensation Sai was the star attraction at a dazzling opening ceremony. The flame was lit up by celebrated Korean actress Lee Young Ai. And now for the lighting of the flame. The men's hockey team captain Sardar Singh was the flag bearer for the Indian contingent of 700 athletes and officials. Two billion people live in India. It's perhaps surprising that they have. Prime Minister Narendra Modi had words of encouragement for the Indian athletes participating at the Games. He wished the contingent on social media on Friday. India will be pinning hopes on its shooters, India. wrestlers so and shuttlers for most of its medal haul at Incheon. Yeah. They all had a successful outing in the recently concluded CWG Games at Glasgow. The contingent had won 64 medals there. In the 2010 edition of the Asian Games in China, India finished with 65 medals including 14 goals. All eyes will be on shooters Abhinav Bindra and Jitu Rai, wrestler Yogeshwar Dutt and shuttlers Saina Nehwal and PV Sindhu. India will also see tennis star Sanya Mirza in action. She's a six-time Asian Games medalist. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV.